What explains this terror, this pain, this joy when people watch football on TV? Tonight, we discover a circuit in our brains that suggests when we watch football, or for that matter, when we go to the movies. Oh, darling, I'm going to die. Or watch a dance. In part of our brain, we're not just watching it. Deep down, we're doing it. What we found is the mechanism that underlies something which is absolutely fundamental to the way that we see other people in the world. Also tonight, hurricanes. So dangerous, so extraordinarily complex, there is no way to predict their power. This one looks like a monster. But tonight we will show you a computer, and there's only one. We're going to uh, dive on into the storm. We are going to fly into the storm. That looks inside the clouds and like an x-ray can see the internal structure of a hurricane. The storms inside the storm. So that one day if you're about to get hit hard, you'll know. You're saying that this street, French Quarter, under 22 feet of water. If I haven't made that direct hit, this is what we'd be looking at. We're swimming here. We're like fish if we're, if we're alive. And we tell the story of a young engineer with an ordinary problem. Time. Time? Time. Time. He doesn't have enough of it. So, with an engineer's precision, he has designed his life, every minute of his life, for maximum efficiency, right down to tying his shoes. You don't do that at home. It's always time at the red lights to tie your shoes. He even designed an algorithm for efficient dating to reduce the incidence of unrequited love. All that unrequited love, you don't want any of that. That's not efficient. And does it work? Well, you'll see. Hello again. Gaze into a mirror, and what do you see? Well, I see my face, of course. But in my face, I see moods, I see shifts of feeling. We humans are really good at reading faces and bodies, because if I can look at you and feel what you're feeling, I can learn from you, connect to you, I can love you. Empathy is one of our finer traits, and when it happens, it happens so easily, perhaps because, and this is brand new science, this is just out of the lab, we may have some special circuitry in our brains that helps us whenever we look at each other. Ask yourself, why do people get so involved, so deeply, deeply involved with such anguish, such pain, such nail-biting tension over football? Cleveland Browns are gambling on defense. Why are we such suckers for sports? And it's not just sports. We can lose it completely at the movies, at video games, watching a dance. Is there something about humans, humans particularly, that allows us to connect so deeply when we watch other people? Watch them moving, watch them playing, watch their faces. Well, as it happens, scientists have an explanation for this strange ability to connect. It's new. It had never been found on the cellular level before. A set of brain cells found on either side of the head. Among all the billions of long, branching cells in our brain, these so-called mirror neurons have surprising power. What we found is the mechanism that underlies something which is absolutely fundamental to the way that we see other people in the world. And it began entirely by accident at a laboratory in the lovely old city of Parma, Italy, where a group of brain researchers was working with monkeys. And they were testing a neuron, that's a brain cell, that always fired, made this sound, yeah, whenever the monkey would grab for a peanut. So the lab had all these peanuts around, and whenever the monkey made its move, the neuron would fire. Scientists thought, now here's a neuron that is essential to motion. It's a motor neuron. Then one day, the monkey was just sitting around, not moving at all, just sitting, when a human scientist came into the lab, and when that scientist grasped the peanut, yeah, 
the monkey's cell fired. Now, the monkey hadn't moved. It was the human that had moved, suggesting that this neuron up here couldn't tell the difference between seeing something and doing something. Seeing and doing were the same. Or more intriguingly, that for this neuron, watching somebody do something is just like doing it yourself. The head of the lab, Giacomo Rizzolatti, thought, wow. The same neurons, one neuron, fire both when the monkey observes something and when the monkey is doing something. It's almost unbelievable. It was surprising because this cell which was involved with motor planning for the monkey turned out to be interested in the movements of other people as well. Some people call them monkey see, monkey do neurons, but the name that stuck is mirror neurons because with them, the brain seems to mirror the movements it sees. This accidental discovery got scientists thinking, doing more tests, and it soon came pretty clear that this is not just a monkey thing. It's a people thing, too. We all know that humans learn by looking and copying. That's what infants do. First you look, then you do. Ready? Let's see your feet this way. And once you've watched and copied and learned a set of moves, you not only have them in your head, you put your shoe on. If you see somebody else doing it, you can share the experience. And you want to do it with me? They know the moves, you know the moves, so you can move with them. Wow. If you can use the years of training that you yourself have done, learning to crawl, then learning to walk, then learning to eat, this is an incredibly rich set of knowledge that you could apply to the problem of actually seeing what's going on. So that's why when I head down this street carrying all these packages, not only do people watch, look how they're watching. They feel my predicament. Because they know what it's like to carry heavy packages. They all know about carrying. So as they watch me moving, they can feel themselves moving. Their neurons are mirroring the action. These neurons may be the brain's way of translating what we see so we can relate to the world. The mirror system is the way that you tap into, the way that you harness your own abilities and project them out into the world. And people are really good at watching and translating what we see. Like with just 13 moving dots, that's all there are here, you'll have no trouble recognizing these uh, very ordinary activities. What's more, tests have shown when a person sees a movie like this of his own movement, he'll recognize it immediately as his own. And that's why sports fans tense with the action and wince and leap. Because if you know the game... then your neurons are firing as if it's you playing, giving a whole new meaning to the phrase armchair quarterback. That's why it's so easy to be a sports fan. But there is more, suggests UCLA professor Marco Iacoboni. He thinks mirror neurons tie us not just to other people's actions, but to other people's feelings. So the idea was to try to figure out how the emotional system and this motor system are connected together. We're going to go in the scanner, what you're going to do is to wear... To demonstrate, he put me into this very powerful fMRI brain scanner that can peer into the brain while it's working. And he gave me some goggles so he could show me pictures when I was in there. So you can see here the eyeball of Robert. And once he had a good view into my brain... Nice looking brain. Thank you. Robert, you're not supposed to talk when we scan you, all right? Sorry. Then he said, okay, I'm going to show you a bunch of faces. And for each face, I want you to imitate it. So I did that. Then he recorded my brain while I moved my facial muscles. We're going to do right away another one. Okay. Then he said, okay, same faces, but this time, don't move a muscle. Just look. So I looked. When we checked the results... Oh, there's my brain. I've never seen my brain before. This is your mirror right now. Jacoboni says that the part of my brain that's working when I make a face, the same part gets busy when I see the face. 
Plus, when I was looking at these faces, I remember feeling extra uncomfortable, kind of bad. But when these faces came on, I felt, I don't know, I felt better, almost happy. And in fact, at the moment I was looking at the happy face, my brain, and this is my brain in that instant, see the red area here? It shows activity in the happy emotional part of my brain. And when I was imitating happy faces, look, I get even a bigger response. This, says Jacoboni, is a consistent result. Mirror neurons, he believes, can send messages to the limbic or emotional system in our brains. So it's possible these neurons help us tune in to each other's feelings. That's empathy. We strongly believe that that's a unifying mechanism that allows people to actually connect at a very simple level. You're saying that there's a place in my brain which, whose job it is to live in other people's minds, live in other people's bodies. That's right. Oh, darling, I'm going to die. Don't let me die. Yeah. And great actors instinctively know that if they put feeling and drama into their bodies... Hold me tight. Don't let me go. ...their faces... It's dark out there alone. ...we will respond. You can't die. You're too brave to die. What actors are expert in is using their movements to inspire feelings in the people watching. These are the experts in the mirror system. We are intensely social creatures. We literally read other people's minds. I don't mean anything psychic like telepathy, but you can adopt another person's point of view. When you put it together, what do you think it's going to be? So if mirror neurons help us connect emotionally, what about people who have trouble with this? Kids like Christian, who has autism. Why do you like Legos? It's been known for some time that children with autism could be quite intelligent, but have a profound deficit in social interaction. There he is. Christian can speak and read and write, but like many kids with autism, he will avoid eye contact. He often misunderstands questions. So Christian, can you tell me what you did in school today? Doing well. You're doing well? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to know what exactly causes this. So Dr. Ramachandran and his graduate student, Lindsay Schenk, designed an experiment. So we're going to be reading your brain waves with this cap. They recorded brain waves while the kids opened and closed their hands, and while they looked at a movie of somebody else's hands. For most people, the brain waves look the same either way, whether they're doing or seeing. But for kids with autism, the wave changes, suggesting possibly that autism may have something to do with broken mirror neurons. Their brains may indeed be different in that regard, and they may have deficits in the mirror neuron system. But we don't know this for sure yet. There needs to be additional work needs to be done using brain imaging. But what we do know, says Ramachandran, is that healthy human beings are intensely social. More than our cousins the monkeys, we invent ways to connect. We invent dances and handshakes and games to play. We eat together. We meet. And we talk. We talk a lot. Get away, get away. Everybody's interested in this question. What makes humans unique? What makes us different from the great apes, for example? You can say humor, you are the laughing biped. Language, certainly. Okay? But another thing is culture. And a lot of culture comes from imitation. Watching your teachers do something. And here, V.S. Ramachandran makes a big leap. He has proposed that at a key moment in our evolution, this is his guess, our mirror neurons got better. And that made all the difference, he says, because once we humans got better at learning from each other, looking, copying, teaching, we could do things the other creatures couldn't. In other words, if you are a bear and suddenly you are, the environment turns cold, you need a few million years to develop a polar bear type layers of fat and fur. It would take many, many, many bear generations to select for furrier bears. But, says Ramachandran, if you're a human, you watch your father slaying another bear and putting on a fur coat, you know, skinning it, using that as a coat, you watch it, you learn it instantly. Your mirror neurons start firing away. 
in your brain. And you perform the same sequence, complicated sequence, instead of going through millions of years of evolution, you've done it in one generation. And while no one's claiming that mirror neurons are the key ingredient that makes us different from other creatures, what these neurons do suggest about us seems almost self-evident. You can see it any Sunday at a sports bar, that deep in our architecture, down in our cells, we are built to be together. There would be very little point in having a mirror system if you lived on your own. There'd be a lot of point in having a digestive system if you lived on your own. There'd be a good point in having a movement system if you lived on your own. There'd be a good point in having a visual system if you lived on your own. But there'd be no point in having a mirror system. The mirror system is the most basic social brain system. It's a brain system which there's no point in having if you don't want to interact or relate to other people. But we do like to interact, and maybe now, as never before, we will understand why. Okay, now, before we leave this subject, we've designed a little um, mirror neuron exercise. What we're going to do is take a wishbone, ordinary wishbone, the kind you break for good luck, and we're going to take it, come on, we're going to take it for a stroll. Now, if your mirror neurons are working properly, when you see anything, even a wishbone walking you know, along, you're not going to just watch that bone, you are going to be that bone. Bone was created and designed by artist Arthur Genson, and later in the program we're going to show you a host of Genson gadgets in glorious motion. But speaking of motion, I wonder if I could have a hurricane, just a small one, please. Thank you. Now, the thing about hurricanes is, if there is one in the neighborhood, and you are, say, over here, the first thing you want to know is, is it coming at me? Because if you are in its path, you're going to want to leave. Thank you. But over the years, scientists have gotten pretty good at predicting the direction of hurricanes, but not so good at predicting a hurricane's intensity. Hurricanes, I'll need again. Hurricanes, because of changes in terrain and in water temperature and all kinds of things down below, can suddenly swell and then diminish and then swell again. And because scientists don't have the tools to read hurricanes that well, these changes are very, very hard to predict until recently, thank you. Because now there's a new development, a kind of CAT scan for hurricanes. As our correspondent Peter Standring reports, predicting a hurricane's power may now get a little easier. When most people think of New Orleans, they think of the French Quarter, Mardi Gras, jazz, Gumba. But according to federal officials, one of the most dire threats facing the nation would be a massive hurricane striking New Orleans. They say that if a major storm had a direct hit here, the effect would be devastating. They're talking perhaps as many as 50,000 dead, up to a million homeless, and a city underwater. And that disaster nearly happened this past hurricane season. When Hurricane Ivan barreled into the Gulf of Mexico, it was on a collision course with New Orleans, a city with a unique vulnerability to hurricanes. This is a very dangerous storm. Hurricane Ivan is approaching us. Fearing the worst, the mayor called for an evacuation of the city. I've been to a couple hurricanes, but this one looks like a monster. I'm hoping that it doesn't hit us directly. Luckily for New Orleans, Ivan veered east at the 11th hour, and the Big Easy dodged a bullet. To get a sense of the damage a hurricane like Ivan would have caused if it had made a direct hit on the city of New Orleans, I met with emergency manager Walter Maestri. Uh, what do we got here? Well, this is a surveyor's rod, and uh, you know, this can extend up to 25 feet, mm. and it shows us just how deep the water would be here. If Ivan came through, and uh, you're getting pretty high, we're there, still getting uh, high. Notice we're, we're probably at about the second level, right? 
There we go. Now watch. We're getting close. We're there. What are we at? 22 feet is what they tell us could be right here in the French Quarter. You're saying that this street, French Quarter, under 22 feet of water. If I haven't made that direct hit, this is what we'd be looking at. We're swimming here. We're like fish if we're, if we're alive. Not good. Not good. Just 50 miles from the Gulf of Mexico, New Orleans is at such great risk because most of the city lies below sea level. Settled in 1718, it's sandwiched between the Mississippi River and Lake Pontchartrain. New Orleans was built on a swamp. And in order to build it, they had to put a wall, a levee, around the swamp and then pump all the water out. As you pump the water out, you allow oxygen to then get into the soils. The oxygen breaks down the organic matter in the soils and they lose bulk and they sink. To keep the river and lake from flooding this ever-deepening bowl, which is more than 12 feet below sea level in some places, hundreds of miles of giant levees, like this one, now surround New Orleans. To get rid of rainwater that collects in the bowl, 22 pump stations were installed throughout the city. These pumps are so powerful, they can suck up 29 billion gallons of water a day from the city and push it all back out into the lake. Now that's enough water to fill the stadium here in New Orleans, the Superdome, in about 35 minutes. But in a strong hurricane, these pumps would be overwhelmed. And the very same levees that protect New Orleans from floods could be its demise. Hurricanes are whirling dynamos, generating enormous winds. These winds create a gigantic swell of water, called a storm surge. And in New Orleans, a storm surge could deliver a fatal one-two punch. Approaching from the Gulf of Mexico, the storm surge would push water into Lake Pontchartrain and up the Mississippi River. As the water level rises, it would overflow the levees on the lake, inundating the city from the north. Some people think a strong enough hurricane would push water over the higher levees along the Mississippi River, flooding the city from the south. In this doomsday scenario, levees intended to keep water out trap it inside New Orleans. And if that bowl fills up, we have no way necessarily to get the water out of here. In essence, Lake Pontchartrain, which surrounds us, is transferred and becomes Lake New Orleans. If anything, the situation is getting even more dangerous. That's because wetlands that provide a natural defense against storm surges are disappearing. To see how, University of New Orleans geologist Shea Penland takes me for a swamp buggy ride into the bayous just a few miles south of the city. Here, between New Orleans and the Gulf of Mexico, is the largest area of coastal wetlands anywhere in the United States. So, Shay, why do we stop here? We stop here because this is an area that was solid land 50 years ago, and today is open water. Healthy wetlands weaken a hurricane by starving it of warm ocean water, its fuel. But in the last 70 years, nearly 2,000 square miles of this protective buffer have eroded due to man-made and natural causes. What is all this land loss mean to the city of New Orleans? The wetlands are our natural speed bump. They're our first line of defense. We have a slow disaster that's kind of eating its way towards the city, then all of a sudden here comes the hurricane, and that major hurricane could be the one on the right track, the right trajectory that puts the storm right down in the city. People can't get out, and we have the 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 dead. And that's the worst case scenario, and, that, and that's, what, that's what we're gambling with right now. With so many lives at risk, accurately predicting these killer storms is a high-stakes endeavor. The forecasters do walk a tightrope when they make forecasts for landfall. You don't want to give people uh, the wrong impression about every storm. You move them harmlessly out of the way, 
and nothing hits, uh, it is a cry wolf kind of syndrome. Just what happened in the wake of Hurricane Ivan? With Ivan closing in on New Orleans, more than 600,000 people evacuated the city. New Orleans shut down. The storm veered off course, but the question remains, when another storm threatens the Louisiana coast, will people evacuate a second time? In recent years, forecasting the track of a hurricane has improved dramatically, but predicting its intensity, how strong it will be when it hits land, is still a difficult challenge. If you just grab your glasses there, I'll give you a test drive. We're going to uh, dive on into the storm. We are going to fly into the storm. NASA is using satellites to understand hurricanes both inside and out. 20, 30 years ago when we used the conventional view of a storm, we could really only see the cloud top. We could see how big the storm was. We could see the white mass which represented the clouds and that was valuable, but that's all we could see. We were just sort of touching the hood of the car. Now we can pop the hood and look inside the storm. To do that, they're using a satellite equipped with weather radar, the only one of its kind. Much the way a CAT scan provides a three-dimensional picture of internal organs, the satellite's radar is producing stunning pictures of a hurricane's internal structure. And these unique images reveal something unexpected. Extremely violent thunderstorms called hot towers, seen here in red. These storms within a storm can reach more than 10 miles into the sky. When we see these hot towers, we think that they are giving us a clue that the storm is releasing a lot of energy. It's firing on all cylinders, if you will, and maybe a sign that the storm is about to undergo intensification processes. So you do think, preliminarily, that there's a link between the abundance of hot towers and how strong and intense a storm is going to be. That's exactly where we are in the research. We don't have enough evidence to conclusively link the number of hot towers or how tall they are to intensity, but our hypothesis is that they might be a sign or a clue that this hurricane is about to enter an intensification phase. And if this work pays off, forecasters will be able to predict more accurately not just where a storm will hit, but whether it will weaken or intensify just before landfall. What really scares me to death is that we get a category two or three hurricane that rapidly intensifies to a category four or five storm. That's the one that could absolutely be catastrophic here because we wouldn't get people out. People wouldn't be moving early as they were for Ivan. They would all be here in the community and all of a sudden we get this wall, this massive wall of water, the double whammy. Every year that goes by, the probability of, of this uh, killer storm uh, occurring increases. It's inevitable that at some point, probably in the next 10, 15 years, there's going to be a tragedy somewhere along the U.S. coastline. It may not be New Orleans, some other high population center. Fairly likely scenario. Gaining a deeper understanding of hurricanes is the best answer. But it won't happen overnight. Here on Bourbon Street, the good times continue to roll. But the party atmosphere masks a widespread concern about the threat of these killer storms. For this city, or any other place that's at risk, improvements in hurricane prediction can't come soon enough. Correspondent Peter Standring. Now I want you to meet somebody who is, well, he is what he is. And what he is is, and you'll see this in the way he plays, the way he works, the way he loves, the way he does his laundry. The man is an engineer, and he's such an engineer that if you were to look deep into his cells, down to the DNA, where the rest of us have AAs and CCs and TTs and GGs, he has, I haven't seen this, but I'm sure it's true, he has E-N-G-I-N-E-E-R. With him, it's genetic, as you're about to see. Like that, okay? <laughs> All right, let's, let's get this going. James McClurkin does not waste time. Just ask his girlfriend, Dara. James said to me when we went out to dinner the first time, I'm a geek. <laughs> it's very important to remember that I am a geek, um, that I build robots, um, and I like it. Um, I've got pet ants. 
Um, I played video games. At only 20, he built what was then one of the world's smallest self-contained autonomous robots. Later, he won the $30,000 Lemelson MIT Prize for remarkable inventiveness. His work's been exhibited at the Smithsonian, and that's just for starters. He was senior lead research scientist at a major robotics company. He's getting his Ph.D. at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. He teaches high school students. Yeah, he got the girlfriend. James is a very, very busy guy, but it's no sweat. Yeah, I am overheating. Well, it's a little sweat. I have four minutes before my next meeting. But not to worry. He says he can do it all and have it all because he has a system. Off we go. Time. Time. Time? Time. 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 Yeah, we got it. He is an engineer. He loves planning and systems analysis, so he has analyzed and planned every minute of his life. Time is the resource that is more precious than any other resource I've got. And he's determined to use that time efficiently. I need to account for it all 168 hours in the week. Every minute needed to be spent either working, sleeping, or playing. For example, driving. His rule is to commute in off hours when traffic is light to save time. And don't tie your shoes at home. That's what red lights are for. It's always time at the red lights to tie your shoes. Lunch, it saves time to eat during class, not before, not after. Very admirable, but says his girlfriend, it doesn't work. He is always late. James always thinks he has more time than he really does. Or he thinks that this, I don't know what it is, he knows better. But the schedule, the schedule's going to work, but it doesn't. And before you know it, you know, you're two hours off. Oh, man. You don't schedule properly. I mean, it's very well scheduled. It's just No, it's much. not. No, no, it's very, it's very precise. It's a serious, intense schedule. There's and it's never, it. and it doesn't ever go according to the times that are here. And it does sometimes, except the events that, right before I see you. Those ones. Yeah, Just almost, those ones. Almost, almost pre events. Mm. That's if he's late, he says it's the system that needs adjusting, so he adjusts the system. Take laundry, for example. Laundry takes a lot of time to get the clothes um, into a pile, to get them in front of the machine. Moving the basket around costs 10, 15 seconds. So James decided it was inefficient to do laundry many times a month. His solution? What you want to do is you want to buy enough clothes that you can wait. He calculated that he needed exactly six weeks of clothing, and then on one big laundry night, he cleans everything. This is what you'd call a system adjustment. There are always system adjustments. For example, his robots. The most important thing to remember about robots is that they're profoundly stupid. So he has a plan. If one robot's got almost no intelligence, you add more robots, you get a little more intelligence and lots of robots, you might even be smart. I'm trying to figure out how you can program a thousand robots to work together to solve a common task. So in this case, he's given 24 robots a simple set of rules in computer code. They will start signaling each other, and without any further direction from him, they should spontaneously perform the theme song from Star Wars. But each of these robots can only play part of the song, only part. If this program works, robots here who are part A robots will gather and play together. Here we go. That's our cameraman there on the left. And now they are gathering in groups, part A robots and part B robots. And here we go. The prelude and the theme. It looks like they've gotten, uh, stuck. Mm. Failure is, um, key to any learning creative process. To any, anything that you're doing, you must fail. Um, if you do not fail, either you are lucky, um, 
Well, actually, no, that was it. But if you're going to fail, you do need to bounce back. And James learned from early on that giving up is not a way to solve your problems. Being black and intelligent in high school in America is a very difficult thing to do. Um, you are, I, I, was, I was a geek. I still am a geek. Um, but I was, I was even geekier back then. The, 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 the Sears pants and the plaid shirts, the big fro. That kind of was. So I was ostracized violently from the African-American community in high school. Um, and uh, didn't quite fit into the honors community because they were all white. So high school was, was very painful uh, socially, a very unpleasant time. But then he got accepted to MIT, and suddenly being geeky was, well, kind of normal. Being able to, to build things and work on things was, was, was all very highly valued. And that reassurance was tremendous at, at my age. And more recently, he's been keeping company with a bunch of females. So here are the ladies. Small females. It's awesome, the systems that nature has developed to live in the world. Insects are amazing. And now... Good morning. On Saturdays, he teaches a class for urban high schoolers at the Seed Academy at MIT. His subject, well, frequently he finds himself talking about systems. So trees are something that you see in computer science all the time. Um, but computer scientists are odd, so they always draw their trees upside down. It's mad cool. He's like one of us. He's like an older, successful version of us. He is successful, but James is still learning there are some things in life, bad relationships, that create systemic problems. All that unrequited love you want, you want, you don't want any of that. That's, that's not efficient. Efficient love. That's a big topic with James. He even designed a do I date this girl algorithm. It's hard, first of all. Um, there, you, the, the goal, stated or unstated, is to stop dating. The goal of dating is to get married at some point in time. What are the odds of me finding a woman that I want to spend a lot of time with? Um, and I can kind of, you know, is it one out of 100, is it one out of 50, is it one out of 20? I know it's not one out of four. Um, um, and I know it's probably less than one out of a million. So I can bracket the probabilities there and say, okay, well then, I don't know what the number is. Um, I need to then tr just try to meet as many women as I can now the goal became, let's get to the first date. And then you get down to the key, which is, I might be interested in them, are they interested in me? I think he babies the ants way too much. That was completely something that I was, I was sold on. Like, I'm feeling this guy, he has ants, just like I've got um, worms. Hold on, we mind. You've got worms? So I've got ants and she's got worms and it really seemed a match made in heaven. Worm loving did not appear on his flow chart, but they clicked. So his life now includes Dara and the worms and the ants, the job, the classes, the robots, and he keeps constantly adjusting his system so he can keep doing it all. James collects ants, and Dara collects worms, and we know a lot of people who collect sand. Don't ask why. But like all collectors, sand fanciers have stories they tell. This one's a mystery, and it's an ancient mystery. For a long, long time, people have noticed that in certain places and under certain conditions, sand sings. Well, sings isn't quite right. There are beaches. Can I get a beach? Thanks. All over the world, where if you walk along, the sand underfoot, you hear this? It, like a frog. It croaks. It's a very distinctive sound. And no one's quite sure what produces the sound. But far more mysterious, and even rarer, there are only about 30 places on Earth where this can happen, sand will... Well, you'll see. Here's our correspondent, Chad Cohen. Listen. You hear that sound? You might think it's the wind, but it's not. It sounds like a sustained musical note coming from the sand dunes themselves. 
This is the sound that has mystified generations. Marco Polo noticed it in the Gobi Desert. Ancient travelers have heard it in the Sahara. Even Charles Darwin puzzled over it in the Chilean desert. So far, no one has been able to explain what it is or why it happens. That's why Caltech engineers Melanie Hunt and Christopher Brennan are here at the Dumont Dunes in Death Valley, California. This location is one of about 30 places around the world that have what are described as booming dunes. For the last two years, the Caltech team has been trying to figure out just what makes these 30 locations so unique. What about them causes the sand to sing? Their theory is that the booming dunes are really like an enormous musical instrument. Imagine the loose moving sand particles on the surface are like the vibrating strings on a cello. And underneath the surface, you'll find a damper, harder layer of sand, which reflects and magnifies the vibrations, just like the body of a cello does. Better get your goggles on. To test their theory, the Caltech team has to trek up the 300-foot-plus dunes. When they reach the peak, they have to simulate an avalanche to put the loose sand in motion and make the surface particles vibrate. A task they've learned is best accomplished on the seat of their pants. Ready, set, go! Well, wait a minute, don't go too fast. But on this, their first run of the day, the dunes are silent. It's too bad, hardly booms at all. What could have gone wrong? Today the wind is not blowing in the normal direction. Usually the wind blows from that direction over this way, leaving a lot of loose sand on this side of the dune. That missing loose sand has an unusual characteristic. The sand grains are almost all the same size so that they resonate together. Now we believe that that's part of the explanation for this booming sign, that all the grains are more or less the same size. So when they flow over one another, they hit each other at a roughly the same frequency, just as a, a bow uh, rubbing over a string has a, a characteristic frequency. 50 feet down the dune, they find what they think they've been looking for, a patch of loose sand that looks promising. Go! As they slide down the dune, at first they hear nothing. Come on, keep going, guys. I got a little bit of a boom. And then, suddenly... A little bit of a boom. You hear it there? We got it! Down here, Mal! It is the music of the dune. Not nearly as loud as it has been other times, but you still did, we still certainly heard it down there. To record and measure this booming sound, a seismic device called a geophone is buried just below the surface. Later, back at Caltech, this data gets fed into a computer. And this shows you that the sound that we were hearing is predominantly a single frequency. A frequency equal to the musical note G. Over the last two years, the Caltech team has observed and documented that the sound of the booming dunes actually changes from day to day and from dune to dune. What ultimately determines the musical range, they think, is not just the size of the sand particles, but also how much space there is between the top where the sand is loose and that hard surface down below. Another four inches, three inches. The greater the distance between the two, the lower the frequency and pitch you know, of the booming dune. Got a good consistency to it, doesn't it? Uh -huh. So, after two years of research and frequent visits to three of the 30 booming dune sites worldwide, 
Here is what the Caltech data has shown. For a dune to boom, it must be at least 150 feet high, there must be loose dry sand of similar particle size at the top and a hard layer below, and the sounds recorded fall into the musical range of either an E, an F, or a G. So, is the mystery solved? Well, not quite yet. There is much more documentation to be done, more readings needed to confirm their theories. But this resourceful team of scientists is hopeful that one day they will be able to prove their premise. And when they do, they can proudly claim that they accomplished it by the seat of their pants. Correspondent Chad Cohen. Oh, I did promise you before we ended tonight that we take a second look at Arthur Ganson's exquisite sculptures. Ganson is self-taught. He never took an engineering course, but he was always an artist, fascinated by things in motion. So here is our look at Arthur Ganson, kinetic sculptor. The scientists and the artist are both passionate about their exploration. What leads to my work is that I'm equally an artist and an engineer. I guess I'm fascinated with motion because I find that whenever anything is moving, I have some feeling about it. It doesn't matter what kind of motion it is. A motion will always evoke some kind of reaction. The impulse for me to want to make sculpture is because I want to make statements really on a purely emotional level. And it's also somewhat of a challenge to see how that can be done with materials and objects that really are not emotional in and of themselves. Initially, the piece can begin as just a feeling about motion and the way something moves. For example, what would it take to make a chair move back and forth? And how would that feel? And then I need to imagine how to manifest that in physical terms. In what, what kind of machine do I need to make? I happen to love engineering. I love figuring things out in a spatial sense. That whole realm of working with mechanical parts and the relationship of the parts and things like ratios and the speeds of particular objects. I've got to build the device in order to see the idea, to see how well the idea can be mirrored in the object. My sculpture comes out of thinking as an artist and thinking as an engineer. Everything about the, the character of my art comes from the fact that I'm passionate about exploring the ideas and the mechanical solutions at the same time. As an engineer or as an artist, every piece is its own investigation. Every piece has its own world and its own solutions, its own infinite possibilities, where someone can come to it and hopefully go in their own personal dreaming journey in wherever it may take them.
That's our show for tonight, but Nova Science Now continues on the web, where you can find out what we're working on for the next episode. You can send us your ideas. You can even watch this broadcast again online, but most importantly, you can tell us what you think. I mean, what you really think. You can find it all at pbs.org slash nova slash science now. I'm Robert Krulwich. Good night. There is more about Nova Science Now, but first this. What kind of machine do I need to make? I happen to love engineering. I love figuring things out in a spatial sense. That whole realm of working with mechanical parts and the relationship of the parts and things like ratios and the speeds of particular objects. I've got to build the device in order to see the idea, to see how well the idea can be mirrored in the object. My sculpture comes out of thinking as an artist and thinking as an engineer. Everything about the, the character of my art comes from the fact that I'm passionate about exploring the ideas and the mechanical solutions at the same time. As an engineer or as an artist, every piece is its own investigation. Every piece has its own world and its own solutions its own infinite possibilities where someone can come to it and hopefully go in their own personal dreaming journey in wherever it may take them. That's our show for tonight, but Nova Science Now continues on the web, where you can find out what we're working on for the next episode. You can send us your ideas. You can even watch this broadcast again online, but most importantly, you can tell us what you think. I mean, what you really think. You can find it all at pbs.org slash nova slash science now. I'm Robert Krulwich. Good night. There is more about Nova Science Now, but first this. But on this, their first run of the day, the dunes are silent. It's too bad, hardly booms at all. What could have gone wrong? 
Today the wind is not blowing in the normal direction. Usually the wind blows from that direction over this way, leaving a lot of loose sand on this side of the dune. That missing loose sand has an unusual characteristic. The sand grains are almost all the same size, so that they resonate together. And we believe that that's part of the explanation for this booming sign, that all the grains are more or less the same size. So when they flow over one another, they hit each other at a roughly the same frequency, just as a, a bow uh, rubbing over a string has a, a characteristic frequency. 50 feet down the dune, they find what they think they've been looking for, a patch of loose sand that looks promising. Go! As they slide down the dune, at first they hear nothing. Come on, keep going, guys. I got a little bit of a boom. And then, suddenly. A little bit of a boom. You hear it there? We got it. Down here, Mal. It is the music of the dune. Not nearly as loud as it has been other times, but you still did, we still certainly heard it down there. To record and measure this booming sound, a seismic device called a geophone is buried just below the surface. Later, back at Caltech, this data gets fed into a computer. And this shows you that the sound that we were hearing is predominantly a single frequency. A frequency equal to the musical note G. Over the last two years, the Caltech team has observed and documented that the sound of the booming dunes actually changes from day to day and from dune to dune. What ultimately determines the musical range, they think, is not just the size of the sand particles, but also how much space there is between the top where the sand is loose and that hard surface down below. Another four inches, three inches. The greater the distance between the two, the lower the frequency and pitch you know, of the booming dune. Got a good consistency to it, doesn't it? Uh -huh. So, after two years of research and frequent visits to three of the 30 booming... The scientists and the artists are both passionate about their exploration. What leads to my work is that I'm equally an artist and an engineer. I guess I'm fascinated with motion because I find that whenever anything is moving, I have some feeling about it. It doesn't matter what kind of motion it is. A motion will always evoke some kind of reaction. The impulse for me to want to make sculpture is because I want to make statements really on a purely emotional level. And it's also somewhat of a challenge to see how that can be done with materials and objects that really are not emotional in and of themselves. Initially, the piece can begin as just a feeling about motion and the way something moves. For example, what would it take to make a chair move back and forth? And how would that feel? And then I need to imagine how to manifest that in physical terms. In what, what kind of machine do I need to make? I happen to love engineering. I love figuring things out in a spatial sense. That whole realm of working with mechanical parts 
and the relationship of the parts and things like ratios and the speeds of particular objects. I've got to build the device in order to see the idea, to see how well the idea can be mirrored in the object. My sculpture comes out of thinking as an artist and thinking as an engineer. Everything about the, the character of my art comes from the fact that I'm passionate about exploring the ideas and the mechanical solutions at the same time. As an engineer or as an artist, every piece is a... New Orleans shut down. The storm veered off course, but the question remains, when another storm threatens the Louisiana coast, will people evacuate a second time? In recent years, forecasting the track of a hurricane has improved dramatically, but predicting its intensity, how strong it will be when it hits land, is still a difficult challenge. If you just grab your glasses there, I'll give you a test drive. We're going to uh, dive on into the storm. We are going to fly into the storm. Without... NASA is using satellites to understand hurricanes both inside and out. 20, 30 years ago when we used the conventional view of a storm, we could really only see the cloud top. We could see how big the storm was. We could see the white mass which represented the clouds and that was valuable, but that's all we could see. We were just sort of touching the hood of the car. Now we can pop the hood and look inside the storm. To do that, they're using a satellite equipped with weather radar, the only one of its kind. Much the way a CAT scan provides a three-dimensional picture of internal organs, the satellite's radar is producing stunning pictures of a hurricane's internal structure. And these unique images reveal something unexpected. Extremely violent thunderstorms called hot towers, seen here in red. These storms within a storm can reach more than 10 miles into the sky. When we see these hot towers, we think that they are giving us a clue that the storm is releasing a lot of energy. It's firing on all cylinders, if you will, and maybe a sign that the storm is about to undergo intensification processes. So you do think, preliminarily, that there's a link between the abundance of hot towers and how strong and intense a storm is going to be. That's exactly where we are in the research. We don't have enough evidence to conclusively link the number of hot towers or how tall they are to intensity, but our hypothesis is that they might be a sign or a clue that this hurricane is about to enter an intensification phase. And if this work pays off, forecasters will be able to predict more accurately not just where a storm will hit, but whether it will weaken or intensify just before landfall. What really scares me to death is that we get a category two or three hurricane that rapidly intensifies to a category four or five storm. That's the one that could absolutely be catastrophic here because we wouldn't get people out. People wouldn't be moving early as they were for Ivan. They would all be here in the community and all of a sudden we get this wall, this massive wall of water, the double whammy. Every year that goes by, the probability of... Oh. Or more intriguingly, that for this neuron, watching somebody do something is just like doing it yourself. The head of the lab, Giacomo Rizzolati, thought, wow. The same neurons, one neuron, fire both when the monkey observes something and when the monkey is doing something. It's almost unbelievable. It was surprising because this cell which was involved with motor planning for the monkey turned out to be interested in the movements of other people as well. Some people call them monkey see, monkey do neurons, but the name that stuck is mirror neurons because with them, the brain seems to mirror the movements it sees. This accidental discovery got scientists thinking, doing more tests, and it soon came pretty clear that this is not just a monkey thing, it's a people thing too. We all know that humans learn by looking and copying. That's what infants do. First you look, then you do. 
let's see your feet this way. And once okay. you've watched and copied and learned a set of moves, you not only have them in your head. Look, you put your shoe on. Yeah, she brushed it. If you see somebody else doing it, you can share the experience. And you want to do it with me? They know the moves, you know the moves, so you can move with them. If you can use the years of training that you yourself have done, learning to crawl, then learning to walk, then learning to eat, this is an incredibly rich set of knowledge that you could apply to the problem of actually seeing what's going on. So that's why when I head down this street carrying all of these packages, not only do people watch, look how they're watching. They feel my predicament. Because they know what it's like to carry heavy packages. They all know about carrying. So as they watch me moving, they can feel themselves moving. Their neurons are mirroring the action. These neurons may be the brain's way of translating what we see so we can relate to the world. The mirror system is the way that you tap into, the way that you harness your own abilities and project them out into the world. And people are really good at watching and translating what we see. Like with just 13 moving dots, that's all there are here, you'll have no trouble recognizing these uh, very ordinary activities. What's more, tests have shown when a person sees a movie like this of his own movement, he'll recognize it immediately as his own. And that's why sports fans tense with the action and wince and leap. Because if you know the game, below the surface. Later, back at Caltech, this data gets fed into a computer. And this shows you that the sound that we were hearing is predominantly a single frequency. A frequency equal to the musical note G. Over the last two years, the Caltech team has observed and documented that the sound of the booming dunes actually changes from day to day and from dune to dune. What ultimately determines the musical range, they think, is not just the size of the sand particles, but also how much space there is between the top where the sand is loose and that hard surface down below. Another four inches, three inches. The greater the distance between the two, the lower the frequency and pitch of the booming dune. Got a good consistency to it, hasn't it? Uh -huh. So, after two years of research and frequent visits to three of the 30 booming dune sites worldwide, here is what the Caltech data has shown. For a dune to boom, it must be at least 150 feet high, there must be loose dry sand of similar particle size at the top, and a hard layer below, and the sounds recorded fall into the musical range of either an E, an F, or a G. So, is the mystery solved? Well, not quite yet. There is much more documentation to be done. More readings needed to confirm their theories. But this resourceful team of scientists is hopeful that one day they will be able to prove their premise. And when they do, they can proudly claim that they accomplished it by the seat of their pants. Correspondent Chad Cohen. Oh, I did promise you before we ended tonight that we take a second look at Arthur Ganson's exquisite sculptures. Ganson is self-taught. He never took an engineering course, but he was always an artist, fascinated by things in motion. So here is our look at Arthur Ganson, kinetic sculptor. The scientists and the artist are both passionate about their exploration. What leads to my work is that I'm equally an artist and an engineer. I guess I'm fascinated with motion because I find that 
sightseers have stories they tell. This one's a mystery, and it's an ancient mystery. For a long, long time, people have noticed that in certain places and under certain conditions, sand sings. Well, sings isn't quite right. There are beaches. Can I get a beach? Thanks. All over the world, where if you walk along, the sand underfoot, you hear this? It, like a frog. It croaks. It's a very distinctive sound. And no one's quite sure what produces the sound. But far more mysterious and even rarer, there are only about 30 places on Earth where this can happen, sand will, well, you'll see. Here's our correspondent, Chad Cohen. Listen. You hear that sound? You might think it's the wind, but it's not. It sounds like a sustained musical note coming from the sand dunes themselves. This is the sound that has mystified generations. Marco Polo noticed it in the Gobi Desert. Ancient travelers have heard it in the Sahara. Even Charles Darwin puzzled over it in the Chilean Desert. So far, no one has been able to explain what it is or why it happens. That's why Caltech engineers Melanie Hunt and Christopher Brennan are here at the Dumont Dunes in Death Valley, California. This location is one of about 30 places around the world that have what are described as booming dunes. For the last two years, the Caltech team has been trying to figure out just what makes these 30 locations so unique. What about them causes the sand to sing? Their theory is that the booming dunes are really like an enormous musical instrument. Imagine the loose moving sand particles on the surface are like the vibrating strings on a cello. And underneath the surface, you'll find a damper, harder layer of sand, which reflects and magnifies the vibrations, just like the body of a cello does. Better get your goggles on. To test their theory, the Caltech team has to trek up the 300-foot-plus dunes. When they reach the peak, they have to simulate an avalanche to put the loose sand in motion and make the surface particles vibrate. A task they've learned is best accomplished on the seat of their pants. Ready, set, go! Well, wait a minute, don't go too fast. But on... Watch them moving, watch them playing, watch their faces. Well, as it happens, scientists have an explanation for this strange ability to connect. It's new. It had never been found on the cellular level before. A set of brain cells found on either side of the head. Among all the billions of long, branching cells in our brain, these so-called mirror neurons have surprising power. What we found is the mechanism that underlies something which is absolutely fundamental to the way that we see other people in the world. And it began entirely by accident at a laboratory in the lovely old city of Parma, Italy, where a group of brain researchers was working with monkeys. And they were testing a neuron, that's a brain cell, that always fired, made this sound whenever the monkey would grab for a peanut. So the lab had all these peanuts around, and whenever the monkey made its move, the neuron would fire. Scientists thought, now here's a neuron that is essential to motion. It's a motor neuron. Then one day, the monkey was just sitting around, not moving at all, just sitting, when a human scientist came into the lab, and when that scientist grasped the peanut, yeah, the monkey's cell fired. Now, the monkey hadn't moved. It was the human that had moved, suggesting that this neuron up here couldn't tell the difference between seeing something and doing something. Seeing and doing were the same. Or more intriguingly, that for this neuron, watching somebody do something is just like doing it yourself. The head of the lab, Giacomo Rizzolatti, thought, wow. The same neurons, one neuron, fire both when the monkey observes something and when the monkey is doing something. It's almost unbelievable. It was surprising because this cell which was involved with motor planning for the monkey turned out to be interested in the movements of other people as well. 
Some people call them monkey see, monkey do neurons, but the name that stuck is mirror neurons because with them, the brain seems to mirror the movements it sees. This accidental discovery got scientists thinking, doing more tests, and it soon came pretty clear that this is not just a monkey thing, it's a people thing too. We all know that humans learn by looking and copying. That's what infants do. First you look, then you do. Ready? Let's see your feet this way. And once you've watched and copied and learned a set of moves, you not only have them in your head. Look, you put your shoe on. If you see somebody else doing it, you can share the experience. And you want to do it with me? They know the moves, you know the moves, so you can move with them. Wow! If you can use the years of training that you yourself have done, learning to crawl, then learning to walk, then learning to eat, this is an increase. This data gets fed into a computer. And this shows you that the sound that we were hearing is predominantly a single frequency. A frequency equal to the musical note G. Over the last two years, the Caltech team has observed and documented that the sound of the booming dunes actually changes from day to day and from dune to dune. What ultimately determines the musical range, they think, is not just the size of the sand particles, but also how much space there is between the top where the sand is loose and that hard surface down below. Another four inches, three inches. The greater the distance between the two, the lower the frequency and pitch you know, of the booming dune. Got a good consistency to it, hasn't it? Uh -huh. So, after two years of research and frequent visits to three of the 30 booming dune sites worldwide, here is what the Caltech data has shown. For a dune to boom, it must be at least 150 feet high, there must be loose dry sand of similar particle size at the top, and a hard layer below and the sounds recorded fall into the musical range of either an E, an F, or a G. So, is the mystery solved? Well, not quite yet. There is much more documentation to be done, more readings needed to confirm their theories. But this resourceful team of scientists is hopeful that one day they will be able to prove their premise and when they do, they can proudly claim that they accomplished it by the seat of their pants. Correspondent Chad Cohen. Oh, I did promise you before we ended tonight that we take a second look at Arthur Ganson's exquisite sculptures. Ganson is self-taught. He never took an engineering course, but he was always an artist, fascinated by things in motion. So. Here is our look at Arthur Ganson, kinetic sculptor. The scientists and the artist are both passionate about their exploration. What leads to my work is that I'm equally an artist and an engineer. I guess I'm fascinated with motion because I find that whenever anything is moving, I have some feeling about it. It doesn't matter what kind of storm, Hurricane Ivan is approaching us. Fearing the worst, the mayor called for an evacuation of the city. I've been to a couple hurricanes, but this one looks like a monster. I'm hoping that it doesn't hit us directly. Luckily for New Orleans, Ivan veered east at the 11th hour, and the Big Easy dodged a bullet. To get a sense of the damage a hurricane like Ivan would have caused if it had made a direct hit on the city of New Orleans, I met with emergency manager Walter Maestri. Uh, what do we got here? Well, this is a surveyor's rod, and, uh, you know, this can extend up to 25 feet, hmm. and it shows us just how deep the water would be here. If Ivan came through, and uh, you're getting pretty high, we're there, still getting uh, high. Notice we're, we're probably at about the second level, right? There we go. Now watch. We're getting close. 
We're there. What are we at? 22 feet is what they tell us could be right here in the French Quarter. You're saying that this street, French Quarter, under 22 feet of water. If I haven't made that direct hit, this is what we'd be looking at. We're swimming here. We're like fish if we're, if we're alive. Not good. Not good. Just 50 miles from the Gulf of Mexico, New Orleans is at such great risk because most of the city lies below sea level. Settled in 1718, it's sandwiched between the Mississippi River and Lake Pontchartrain. New Orleans was built on a swamp, and in order to build it, they had to put a wall, a levee, around the swamp, and then pump all the water out. As you pump the water out, you allow oxygen to then get into the soils. The oxygen breaks down the organic matter in the soils, and they lose bulk, and they sink. To keep the river and lake from flooding this ever-deepening bowl, which is more than 12 feet below sea level in some places, hundreds of miles of giant levees, like this one, now surround New Orleans. To get rid of rainwater that collects in the bowl, 22 pump stations were installed throughout the city. These pumps are so powerful, they can suck up 29 billion gallons of water a day from the city and push it all back out into the lake. Now that's enough water to fill the stadium here in New Orleans, the Superdome, in about 35 minutes. But in a strong hurricane, these pumps would be overwhelmed. And the very same levees that protect New Orleans from floods could be its demise. Hurricanes are whirling dynamos, generating enormous winds. These winds create a gigantic swell of water, called a storm surge. And in New Orleans, a storm surge could deliver... James collects ants, and Dara collects worms, and we know a lot of people who collect sand. Don't ask why. But like all collectors, sand fanciers have stories they tell. This one's a mystery, and it's an ancient mystery. For a long, long time, people have noticed that in certain places and under certain conditions, sand sings. Well, sings isn't quite right. There are beaches. Can I get a beach? Thanks. All over the world, where if you walk along, the sand underfoot, you hear this? It, like a frog. It croaks. It's a very distinctive sound. And no one's quite sure what produces the sound. But far more mysterious, and even rarer, there are only about 30 places on Earth where this can happen, sand will... Well, you'll see. Here's our correspondent, Chad Cohen. Listen. You hear that sound? You might think it's the wind, but it's not. It sounds like a sustained musical note coming from the sand dunes themselves. This is the sound that has mystified generations. Marco Polo noticed it in the Gobi Desert. Ancient travelers have heard it in the Sahara. Even Charles Darwin puzzled over it in the Chilean Desert. So far, no one has been able to explain what it is or why it happens. That's why Caltech engineers Melanie Hunt and Christopher Brennan are here at the Dumont Dunes in Death Valley, California. This location is one of about 30 places around the world that have what are described as booming dunes. For the last two years, the Caltech team has been trying to figure out just what makes these 30 locations so unique. What about them causes the sand to sing? Their theory is that the booming dunes are really like an enormous musical instrument. Imagine the loose moving sand particles on the surface 
are like the vibrating strings on a cello. And underneath the surface, entirely by accident, at a laboratory in the lovely old city of Parma, Italy, where a group of brain researchers was working with monkeys. And they were testing a neuron, that's a brain cell, that always fired, made this sound, yeah, whenever the monkey would grab for a peanut. So the lab had all these peanuts around, and whenever the monkey made its move, the neuron would fire. Scientists thought, now here's a neuron that is essential to motion. It's a motor neuron. Then one day, the monkey was just sitting around, not moving at all, just sitting, when a human scientist came into the lab. And when that scientist grasped the peanut, yeah, the monkey's cell fired. Now, the monkey hadn't moved. It was the human that had moved, suggesting that this neuron up here couldn't tell the difference between seeing something and doing something. Seeing and doing were the same. Or more intriguingly, that for this neuron, watching somebody do something is just like doing it yourself. The head of the lab, Giacomo Rizzolatti, thought, wow. The same neurons, one neuron, fire both when the monkey observes something and when the monkey is doing something. It's almost unbelievable. It was surprising because this cell which was involved with motor planning for the monkey turned out to be interested in the movements of other people as well. Some people call them monkey see, monkey do neurons, but the name that stuck is mirror neurons, because with them, the brain seems to mirror the movements it sees. This accidental discovery got scientists thinking, doing more tests, and it soon came pretty clear that this is not just a monkey thing, it's a people thing too. We all know that humans learn by looking and copying. That's what infants do. First you look, then you do. Ready? Let's see your feet this way. And once okay, you've right. watched and copied and you learned do. a set of moves, you not only have them oh, yeah. in your head. Look, you put your shoe on. Yeah, yeah, she brushed it. If you see somebody else doing it, you can share the experience. And you want to do it with me? They know the moves, you know the moves, so you can move with them. If you can use the years of training that you yourself have done, learning to crawl, then learning to walk, then learning to eat, this is an incredibly rich set of knowledge that you could apply to the problem of actually seeing what's going on. So that's why when I head down this street carrying all these packages, not only do people watch, look how they're watching. They feel my predicament. Because they know what it's like to carry heavy packages. They all know about carrying. So as they watch me moving, they can feel themselves moving. Their neurons are mirroring the action. 